Big Brother, 1984, with me, Morel Bernard. Welcome. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. O'Brien had stood up. He had taken off his spectacles and was in the act of resettling them on his nose with his characteristic gesture. But there was a fraction of a second when their eyes met. And for as long as it took to happen, Winston knew, yes, he knew that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. An unmistakable message had passed. It was though their two minds had opened and the thoughts were flowing from one into the other through their eyes. I am with you, O'Brien seemed to be saying to him. I know precisely what you are feeling. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry, I am on your side. And then the flash of intelligence was gone. And O'Brien's face was an inscrutable as everybody's else's. That was all. And he was already uncertain whether it had happened. Such incidents never had any sequel. All that they did was to keep alive in him the belief or hope that others beside himself were the enemies of the party. Perhaps the rumours of vast underground conspiracies were true, after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really existed. It was impossible, in spite of the endless arrests and confessions and executions, to be sure that the Brotherhood was not simply a myth. Some days he believed in it, some days not. There was no evidence, only fleeting glimpses that might mean anything or nothing. Snatches of overheard conversation, faint scribbles on laboratory walls, once even. When two strangers met a small movement of a hand, which had looked as though it might be a signal of recognition. It was all guesswork. Very likely he had imagined everything. He had gone back to his cubicle without looking at O'Brien again. The idea of following up their momentary contact hardly crossed his mind. It would have been inconceivably dangerous, even if he had known how to set about doing it. For a second, two seconds, they had exchanged an equivocal glance, and that was the end of the story. But even that was a memorable event in the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Winston roused himself and sat up straighter. He let out a belch. The gin was rising from his stomach. His eyes refocused on the page. He discovered that while he sat helplessly musing, he had also been writing, as though by automatic action, and it was no longer the same cramped, awkward handwriting as before. His pen had slid voluptuously over the smooth paper, printing in large, neat capitals, Down with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother, with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother, over and over again, filling half a page. He could not help feeling a twinge of panic. It was absurd, since the writing of those particular words was not more dangerous than the initial act of opening the diary. But for a moment, he was tempted to tear out the spoiled pages and abandon the enterprise altogether. He did not do so, however, because he knew that it was useless. Whether he wrote down with Big Brother or whether he refrained from writing it made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary or whether he did not go on with it made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed, would still 
have committed, even if he had never set pen to paper, the essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime, they called it. Thought crime was not a thing that could be concealed forever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later they were bound to get you. It was always at night. The arrest invariably happened at night. The sudden jerk out of bed, sleep, the rough hand shaking your shoulder, the lights glaring in your eyes, the ring of hard faces round the bed. In the vast majority of cases, there was no trial, no report of the arrest. People simply disappeared, always during the night. Your name was removed from the registers. Every record of everything you had ever done was wiped out. Your one-time existence was denied and then forgotten. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporised was the usual word. For a moment, he was seized by a kind of hysteria. He began writing in a hurried, untidy scrawl. They'll shoot me, I don't care, they'll shoot me in the back of the neck. I don't care, down with big brother. They always shoot in the back of the neck. I don't care, down with big brother. He sat back in his chair, slightly ashamed of himself, and laid down the pen. The next moment, he started violently. There was a knocking at the door. Already, he sat as still as a mouse in the futile hope that whoever it was might go away for a single attempt. But no, the knocking was repeated. The worst thing of all would be to delay. His heart was thumping like a drum, but his face, from long habit, was probably expressionless. He got up and moved heavily towards the door. As he put his hand to the doorknob, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written all over it, in letters almost big enough to be legible across the room. It was an inconceivably stupid thing to have done. But he realised, even in his panic, he had not wanted to smudge the creamy paper by shutting the book while the ink was wet. He drew in his breath and opened the door. Instantly, a warm wave of relief flowed through him. A colourless, crushed-looking woman with whipsy hair and a lined face was standing outside. Oh, comrade, she began in a dreary, whining sort of voice. I thought I heard you come in. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up and... It was Mrs Parsons, the wife of a neighbour on the same floor. Mrs was a word somewhat discountenanced by the party. You were supposed to call everyone comrade. But with some women, one used it instinctively. She was a woman of about 30, but looking much older. One had the impression that there was dust in the creases of her face. Winston followed her down the passage. These amateur repair jobs were an almost daily irritation. Victory mansions were old flats built in the 1930s or thereabouts and were falling to pieces. The plaster flaked constantly from ceilings and walls. The pipe burst in every hard frost the roof leaked whenever there was snow the heating system was usually running at half steam when it was not closed down altogether from motives of economy repairs even what you could do for yourself had to be sanctioned by remote committees which were liable to hold up even the 
mending of a window pane for two years. Of course, it's only because Tom isn't home, said Mrs Parsons vaguely. The Parsons flat was bigger than Winston, and dingy in a different way. Everything had a battered, trampled on look as though the place had just been visited by some large, violent animal. Games, impedimenta, hockey sticks, box gloves, a burst football, a pair of sweaty shorts turned inside out lay all over the floor, and on the table there was a litter of dirty dishes and dog-eared exercise books. On the walls were scarlet banners of the Youth League and the Spies, and a full-size poster of Big Brother. There was the usual boil cabbage smell common to the whole building, but it was shot through by a sharper reek of sweat, which only knew this as the first sniff, though it was hard to say how, was the sweat of some person not present at the moment. In another room, someone with a comb and a piece of toilet paper was trying to keep tune with the military music which was issuing from the telescreen. It's the children, said Mrs Parson, casting a half apprehensive glance at the door. They haven't been out today, and of course, she had a habit of breaking off her sentences in middle. The kitchen sink was full, nearly to the brim, with filthy greenish water, which smelt worse than ever of cabbage. Winston knelt down and examined the angle joint of the pipe. He hated using his hands, and he hated bending down, which was always liable to start him coughing. Mrs Parson looked on helplessly. Of course, if Tom was home, he'd put it right in a moment, she said. He loves anything like that. He's ever so good with his hands, Tom is. Parsons was Winston's fellow employee at the Ministry of Truth. He was a fattish but active man of paralysing stupidity, a mass of imbecile enthusiasm, one of those completely unquestioning devoted drudges, on whom, more even than on the thought police, the stability of the party depended. At 35, he had just been unwillingly evicted from the Youth League, and before graduating into the Youth League, he had managed to stay on in the spies for a year beyond the statutory age. At the Ministry, he was employed in some subordinate post for which intelligence was not required. But on the other hand, he was a leading figure on the sports committee and all the other committees engaged in organising community hikes, spontaneous demonstrations, saving campaigns and voluntary activities generally. He would inform you with quiet pride between whiffs of his pipe that he had put in an appearance at the community centre every evening for the past four years. An overpowering smell of sweat, a sort of unconscious testimony of the to the strenuousness of his life, followed him about wherever he went and even remained behind him after he had gone. Have you got a spanner? said Winston, fiddling with the nut on the angle joint. A spanner, said Mrs Parson, immediately becoming invertebrate. I don't know. I'm sure. Uh, Perhaps the children. There was a trampling of boots and another blast on the comb as the children charged into the living room. Mrs Parsons brought the spanner. Winston let out the water and disgustedly removed the clot of human hair that had blocked up the pipe. He cleaned his fingers as best as he could in the cold water from the tap and went back into the other room. Up with your hands, yelled a savage voice. A handsome, tough-looking boy of nine had popped up from behind the table and was menacing him with a toy automatic pistol, while his small sister, about two years younger, 
made the same gesture with a fragment of wood. Both of them were dressed in the blue shorts, grey shirts, and red neckshirts, which were the uniform of the spies. Winston raised his hands above his head, but with an uneasy feeling, so vicious was the boy's demeanour that it was not altogether a game. You're a traitor, yelled the boy. You're a thought criminal. You're a Eurasian spy. I'll shoot you. I'll vaporise you. I'll send you to the salt mines. Suddenly, they were both leaping round, shouting, traitor, and thought criminal. The little girl, imitating her brother in every movement. It was somehow slightly frightening like the gamboling of tiger cubs, uh, which will soon grow up into man-eaters. There was a sort of calculating ferocity in the boy's eyes, a quite evident desire to hit or kick Winston, and a consciousness of being very nearly big enough to do so. It was a good job. It was not a real pistol he was holding, Winston thought. Mrs. Parson's eyes flitted nervously from Winston to the children and back again. In the better light of the living room, he noticed with interest that there actually was dust in the creases of her face. They do get so noisy, she said. They're disappointed because they couldn't go to see the hanging. That's what it is. I'm too busy to take them and Tom won't be back from work in time. Why can't we go and see the hanging? roared the boy in his huge voice. Want to see the hanging? Want to see the hanging? chanted the little girl, still capering around. Some Eurasian prisoners guilty of war crimes were to be hanged in the park that evening, Winston remembered. This happened about once a month and was a popular spectacle. Children always clamoured to be taken to see it. He took his leave of Mrs. Parson and made for the door. But he had not gone six steps down the passage when something hit the back of his neck, an agonising, painful blow. It was as though a red-hot wire had been jabbed into him. He spun round just in time to see Mrs. Parson dragging her son back into the doorway while the boy pocketed a catapult. Goldstein bellowed the boy as the door closed on him. But what most struck Winston was the look of helpless fright on the woman's greyish face. Back in the flat, he stepped quickly past the telescreen and sat down at the table again, still rubbing his neck. The music from the telescreen had stopped. Instead, A clipped military voice was reading out with a sort of brutal relish, a description of the armaments of the new floating fortress that had just been anchored between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. With those children, he thought, that wretched woman must lead a life of terror. Another year, two years, and they would be watching her night and day for symptoms of unorthodoxy. Nearly all children nowadays were horrible. What was worst of all was that, by means of such organisation as the spies, they were systematically turned into ungovernable little savages, and yet this produced in them no tendency whatsoever to rebel against the discipline of the party. On the contrary, they adore the party, and everything connected with it. The songs the processions, the banners, the hiking, the drilling, with dummy rifles, the yelling, the slogans, the worship of Big Brother. It was all a sort of glamorous game to them. All their ferocity was turned outwards against the enemy of the state, against foreigners, traitors, saboteurs, thought criminals. It was almost normal for people over 30 to be frightened of their own children, and with good reason. For hardly a wee past in which The Times did not carry a paragraph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak child hero, was the phrase generally used, had overheard some compromising remark 
and denounced its parents to the thought police. Whoa, what are the children doing? This is 1984, Big Brother. This is Morale Bernard. Do listen to the next episode of 1984, Big Brother. Listen to the next episode of Big Brother, 1984. I'll see you then. Bye for now. Bye.